Welcome to C++ Club. This is meeting 157, and today is the 8th of December 2022. Good news, everyone! C++ overtakes Java in TLB Language Popularity Index. Actually, that doesn't mean anything, as you probably know. But um, yeah, a good um, headline, I suppose. There is a Reddit discussion about it. Uh, actually, the article shows the ranking. First place Python, second C, third C++, fourth Java, and then C Sharp, Visual Basic, and so on. So on C Reddit. It's probably higher than C++. Well, if you believe so, this rating. Uh, well, there, there's uh, this language C slash C++ that people always talk about, which I somehow never have encountered. Um, anyway, uh, look to see how TOB is actually calculated and it's it's measuring noise i think all of the uh, complaints and uh, stuff about c++ has been good to us in terms of TOB. people complain Indeed. a lot uh, the language goes up it's not such a thing about as bad advertisement i guess there's no such thing as bad advertising you're right so uh, Stefan T. Loverway of Microsoft commented on Reddit. He said, quote, TLB is junk information, regardless of whether it seems to be good or bad news for C++. There's nothing useful about it, nothing that will help people make better decisions. I believe that posts about it should consistently be removed. That is, C++ is becoming more popular, is actually as annoying as C++ is becoming less popular Oh my God, whatever shall we do when the measure is distorted beyond any connection to reality? Unfortunately, not everybody realizes that. It's so often I hear somebody say that the rankings mean something. I mean, all the surveys say C++ is more widely used than C. And every one of these measurements based on web information uh, says C is used significantly more than C++, or at least a little bit. It, it's like the college rankings. Uh, it measures something, and you're not quite sure what. Maybe some query results are parsed wrong, and the plus plus is dropped on some of the answers. I had that theory, and I tried to verify it, and failed. Uh, it, it didn't seem, at least it didn't seem obvious, so... So, other notable replies in the thread were Rust will overtake C++ versus No, it won't. Another quote was C++ got much nicer with C++ 17 and 20, so obviously those who were disgusted by pre-C++ 17 or even pre-C++ 11 are coming back to C++. Another quote Only a fool starts a new embedded project using C unless it's for a rare niche platform that doesn't have a working C++ environment. Unfortunately, there are still many fools around. And in reply to that, another quote. Only a fool starts a new embedded project in C++ unless it's for a rare niche platform that doesn't have a working Rust hardware ab abstraction layer. So there you go. Rust is getting mentioned everywhere. On to more interesting topics. Kaunat trip reports are coming in. This one's by Herb Sutter. He says it's a first hybrid in-person remote conference and it went smoothly thanks to Jens Maurer and Dietmar Kuhl leading a group of volunteers to, who trialed this in September. So it looks like the hybrid uh, meeting wasn't as bad as feared. It wasn't a total disaster, but as somebody who attended it uh, remotely. I can't say I was very pleased. The time difference was bad. The fact that I wasn't away from my normal work was bad. And uh, the larger groups, uh, like the evolution group, it was hard to keep track of who was uh, speaking. Uh, and when you want to talk about sort of more general philosophical directional things, 
it's not anywhere near as effective as it is in a small group focused on specific issues. So for issue processing, it worked rather nicely. But I'm mostly interested in, I, I'm not too pleased, I'll be there in person in the next couple of times. So it's always uh, the, the size and the topic matters immensely, and people sometimes forget that. Well, hopefully more people will be there in person next time, and also the experience uh, with remote attendance will help make it smoother in the future, maybe. Uh, Herb says about extending the lifetime of temporaries for the four range initializer of the range for loop. Looks like we are getting it fixed in C++23, but this lifetime will not be extended anywhere else. So it'll be another special case according to the wording proposed in a separate paper. Is this a good thing for teaching? I guess, you know, it's easier not to have to explain this at the very beginning when maybe you want to introduce the for loop, the for range loop as a concept, and you don't want to explain the, the lifetime extension rule, but, um, then you're going to have to eventually explain another special case um, instead of just the reasoning behind the original special case. Jan, what do you think about this? You have extensive experience here. Did you vote for this? Um, I don't remember. Um, let, let's say it this way. <clears throat> what you just said was that uh, several people felt that you shouldn't have more special cases but we couldn't find a general case that would actually solve this, except by having temporaries live uh, to the end of this scope always. That would have solved the problem. And the reason they don't is that that meant that uh, there was a lot of extra pressure on the memory and the registers, and that was why it was moved uh, to the uh, scope of the uh, the statement um, back in, I think, 82 or 83. No, it must have been 83. Um, and there were some complaints that if we, that even this extension would uh, create more memory pressure. That is, it, it saves a lot of beginners from a lot of problems. And for that reason, people uh, were in favor of it strongly. And they claim that the people that has expert problems are experts and won't have problems with the um, special case here. Well, I suppose it will help um, improve safety of, of the construct without for, any... some, for some definition of safety. It will mean that certain users will not get bugs that they uh, get now. Uh, Nico. Uh, Yusotis uh, was very, very vocal on people getting bitten by temporaries and not understanding uh, the lifetime of temporaries. And uh, that was why the proposal was made, and that was why the proposal su succeeded. Uh, there will still be uh, people that get bitten by uh, lifetime of temporaries, but not in this particular case. I do wonder if after they fix this very ad hoc uh, case, uh, if you probably be able still to get into the same problem if you manually write the code that usually the compiler writes for you for the for range loop, which is auto refref and then the, the object. The, 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 argument, the, the argument is that it takes care of the common case. And I don't think anybody claimed that it solved all the cases. And the discussion was whether that mattered. Mm -hmm. The people that claim that you shouldn't have an extra uh, case was voted down massively. It's a difficult thing to... Uh, I mean, I am of two minds of this, because on one hand, I'm happy that maybe newcomers will have less problems, but then my brain uh, is already uh, having a hard time coping with all the special cases already, so that's my problem, I guess. There was an, another paper that I uh, briefly glanced at uh, about a more common case of um, initialization and 
um, temporaries. Uh, there was a keyword uh, used, constinit or something. Um, ah, the one that introduces extra keywords in front of the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that there one, was an extra stuff, you know, that looks even more confusing. I don't know. Yeah, I've seen in the in the mailing list. Hmm. Right. So in Kona, it looks like contract roadmap was adopted, which makes it slightly more possible to have contracts in SQL Plus 26, I think. Also, standard execution is coming in C++26. I C++ think uh, when you take up contrast, uh, you should look for a paper by Gabby. Uh, that's a bit hard to read, but basically it's trying to avoid having you be in, um, in contract predicates. If you have you be in a contract predicate, you could have a contract test check removed completely by the optimizer. Uh, ah, and, right. Uh, that is the problem Gabby is trying to deal with. I don't think people read or realized that that means that you can put a contract in, put a predicate in that's a little bit elaborate. The compiler decides that um, there's you be in what you wrote. Therefore, it doesn't have to do your uh, contract check. And that is the problem that Gabby is trying to address. There also, there was a paper I uh, submitted, which is about uh, the fact that you can't use contracts in any library that is meant to be used in a program that may not terminate uh, unconditionally. Yeah, I saw a paper that was a set of questions regarding um, Gabby's paper. And... Gabby is answering that for the next mailing, and uh, the point about UB that I just made will be more prominent this time. I think Gabby was uh, mm. uh, too indirect and subtle and detailed and assumed people understood the problem. Yeah, my impression after reading that questions paper was that the questions were mostly about avoiding side effects. I don't think that's the main issue. Personally, I don't mind side effects, um, but I do mind UB and eliminating by time travel optimizations, eliminating contract uh, checks. If you do include side effects in the contract, does it mean that uh, usually you would keep the contract check on? By default in the release, uh, is there like a way to disable it? What's the design? I don't think that's specific to this design, but there are people who keep contract checks on in the ship code. And I would at least like to leave some contracts uh, in uh, some programs. There are people who think that contract checks should never be uh, shipped. And I think are not quite realistic. They have not seen industrial uses of contract systems. It's a theoretical position. Um, and you can afford it in many applications, even if there are places where you can't. The vast majority of code is, can afford some contract checks. But, but as I said, the, I think the issue is you be and termination, not side effects. If you don't like side effects, don't write them. That's a perfectly logical um, position. If you don't like you be and don't write it, it's not a viable statement. Um, in C++26, we're also getting standard execution, it looks like. And also, hash embed is coming to C++26. The C++ ecosystem international standard was accepted. Yes, so um, we have tool interoperability on the horizon, hopefully. And the next meeting will be in Isakwa uh, in February 2023. Another trip report by Karantin Jabot. Um, he wrote about certain uh, proposals, um, his own views enumerate, and I think it's coming in 
to C++23 and with some caveats. Basically, the issue seems to be what kind of type you would get by enumerating a view, because uh, the idea is that it's a view that yields an index and an element for each element of a range, which should be convenient. But um, there was an, a question of whether it was a tuple or something akin to a pair or something completely custom. And I think it will be a tuple. Uh, he also has a paragraph on uh, C++ safety and its future, mentioned con concerns that C++ uh, is being discouraged for new projects by several branches of the US government. He says there is no solution, but uh, there are plethora of targeted solutions to fix some of the common vulnerability vectors. And one of those, he says, is sanitizers. And by employing hardware support for certain features on new hardware platforms like ARM chips and recently Intel as well, uh, it's possible to make sanitizers much faster. Gabby and I have a paper discussing an approach that gives complete types and uh, resource safety. And that's being tested out in, in the Microsoft uh, Static Analyzer and uh, the core guidelines. You don't have to take the overhead of sanitizers. Um, they, they, they will help till we get something better, but we can do better than that. Uh, read Gabby and my paper. Um, and there's more coming in that direction. Is this something new? Can it, can we do some Googling on this? Uh, I'm, I'm extremely interested. Uh, I, think, I think it was shipped. Let me just look. Was it in this latest mailing? By I think, I think so. Right, so this is the mailing. Yes, it's uh, P2687 by me and Gabby. 26. Um, hang on. Yeah, it's at the bottom. It, it points out that uh, there's many different kinds of safety that different people like. You have to be able to support a variety, not just safety is not just one thing. And we point out that uh, one of the problems you have to deal with is uh, how do you give safety guarantees in an environment where not all code is written to the same standard. I think those are the two key problems. And then, of course, we have to maintain the right decent code and you can get decent performing code and all this other good stuff. If you slow down or complicate C++ too much, or if you change the semantics of various things, people will just uh, use the old stuff. We actually have to match uh, what we can do now for people to keep, keep using C++. If you, if you get a slow version of Java, was a safe C++, it was advertised like that. Um, just get something that isn't C++ and people will need something at the lower level that doesn't provide the guarantees so that they can run fast. This is not an easy problem. So this is R0. It uh, was done to be in this million and uh, R1 will have many more examples. Right. The paper uh, C++ is the next C++ has a new revision in this mailing and it specifically addresses the differences between uh, your paper and uh, that one. I haven't read uh, yet. So this is the paper revision one. This is about introducing subsets of C++ on the module basis using attributes 
that provides certain uh, static checking. And in the frequently asked questions, one of them is, uh, do you fear that this could create a subset of C++ that could split the user community and cause acrimony? Uh, this is the quote from um, your paper. He says, does this paper create a subset? Yes. Like it or not, C++ already has a couple of subsets, some positive, some quasi. Freestanding is a subset for low-level programming. This proposal primarily focuses on high-level programming, but there is nothing preventing the creation of static analysis, inclusions, freestanding, attribute. The C++ value categories have, to some degree, fractured the community into a clergy class that thoroughly understands its intricacies and the, the other class that gleefully uses it. Does this paper split the user community? Yes and no. It splits code into safer, versus less safe, high level versus low level. However, this is performed at the module level, allowing the same programmer to decide what falls on either side of the fence. Yeah, so it's evident that safer modules using less safe modules would be a problem. And uh, unsafe code using safe code is also a problem because uh, the safe code assumes uh, certain guarantees. It's it's a difficult question. That's a thing that discussed in some detail in Gabby and mine. Yeah. So and, Jared, and I, and I feel it's missed. Uh, both the 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 general discussion sort of out on the web uh, is safe versus not safe, and safe is, in my opinion, not one thing, and it's also absolute uh, all the code being safe uh, or none but the point is that all of the um, safe languages use unsafe languages in their uh, implementation what they deem unsafe and they call unsafe uh, modules like the operating system uh, as part of their implementation so it's not that easy to get away from the problems and we have to think pretty hard about how to do that best. There's a lot of gut reaction there, which I think we we'll have to worry about because it takes thought. Seems like it's also a marketing problem. Like we have somehow a bad reputation, whereas not all the good reputation of some other uh, languages is warranted. A lot of the other languages are marketing themselves by saying C++ is bad and we're not C++. That's their main marketing trick. And that has been happening throughout uh, history. So I'm, I'm not surprised. Another section of his uh, Jared Waterloo's um, paper talks about the differences between this his paper and uh, your design alternatives for type and resource safety plus plus. He says it's different audiences and different scopes and different solutions. And quite a lot of text. But, yeah. Some more from Kona. This paper, a plan for better template metaprogramming facilities in C plus plus twenty six. Carantan mentions it in his report. And he's disappointed at the reception for this. This paragraph in his report is indexing a pack. So the idea was that variadic argument pack would be indexable like a, an array or a container. And that would simplify metaprogramming. Um, there wasn't a consensus on this. But at least there was an encouragement for more work in this direction. Uh, some people said that reflection will solve this problem. But um, he says, don't get me wrong, I fully support reflection, although I will say that we have not made progress in the past few years. But using reflection to index a pack is like trying to kill a fly with a nuclear warhead. There is a quote by Andre Alexandrescu who says, Given the C++ parameter pack P, how do you get the nth type in it? And then there is a pretty long line of code, which does it. 
And then Andre says, quote, C++ variadic templates seem to be the result of a gang war. One faction wanted to make them as complicated as possible. Another wanted to give variadics as little power as possible. Those gangs cancelled each other out, and the design was done by a group of tech macro experts. Some people like very uh, fancy codes. They don't always relate exactly to reality. I tend to dismiss any code that uh, mentions atomics, except if it actually is discussing nuclear power plants and things like that. But just throwing them in for effect is, I think, distracting. It is a bit, yes. This is Carantin's example of hash embed. Um, so you say constant signed char foo array equals uh, open brace, and then you say hash embed foo.bin closed brace, and that will give you an array of unsigned characters read from that file at build time. Another interesting proposal that seems to have been accepted is using underscore as the name of a variable whose name really doesn't matter. I've seen that in other languages like Scala, and I guess that should be useful. Just ignore any underscore named variables in, in the current scope. And Another accepted proposal for C23 is static operator uh, subscript. So this is going to be a class level subscript operator. Uh, the next is a lighter topic. Mark Rusinovich, the author of well known Windows Sys internals tools, he's also a CTO of Azure. He tweeted, speaking of languages, it's time to halt starting any new projects in C slash C++ and use Rust for those scenarios where a non-garbage collected language is required. For the sake of security and reliability, the industry should declare those languages as deprecated. To that, I laugh in C slash C++. <laughs> I copied the tweet into the show notes in case he decides to delete it later, or if Space Karen finally kills Twitter. There are lots of discussions on Reddit about it, and uh, some quotes. The AAA games industry would beg to differ. No one seems to take it seriously, except those who need to write articles with catchy titles. Like this one in Ziff Davis Net magazine, Programming languages, it's time to stop using C and C++ C++ for new projects, says Microsoft as US CTO. This is uh, one of the people we can thank for the higher rating of C++ on C++. <laughs> that is true. The register accidentally invokes the Better Ridges law of headlines with their article t titled is it time to retire C and C++ for Rust in new programs? And if you don't know, Betteridge's law of headlines says that if a headline is a question, the answer is usually no. Uh, I, I didn't know that rule. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an unofficial law, and uh, Mr. Betteridge is a British journalist who's on Twitter, and he likes to, people like to like mention him when they see a headline like that. This article also caused probably a spike in C++ searches um, for TOB. The pool of talented C++ developers is running dry. Yeah, it, it may be true. It's partly because all the good ones are already employed. And uh, it seems that the number of C++ programmers are still going up significantly. So either the pool of good programmers are not growing or um, 
the new ones aren't quite as good as the old ones, or maybe they're not quite as experienced yet because they haven't got enough years on their backs. Um, this is very difficult to, to understand. But we would all like to see more uh, and better C++ programmers. At least we've got more. Uh, in the Reddit thread for this article, someone said, I know I retired recently, but I didn't expect it to have such an impact. But seriously, companies having trouble attracting people might want to look at what they are offering. Perhaps cheap and talented C++ developers are hard to find? Definitely. And the article starts with this quote. Software companies have a problem. There is not enough candidates that can, that can code C++. This was the consensus in a, in a webinar from ProfitView, a crypto trading tools developer on high frequency trading using C++. A cryptocurrency trading firm can't find good developers. Hmm. The quote goes, where are all the C++ programmers? People are seemingly scared away from the language by a terrible stigma, the notion that it is a legacy program. With big names in tech such as Microsoft Azure CEO Mark Rusinovich calling people to deprecate C++ for the sake of security and reliability in favor of Rust, this is hardly surprising. The surveys I have seen says that in over the last five years, the C++ developer community grew by two million. That's how much in a month and how many developers, full-time developers, does other languages have. It's a lot of this stuff is just hot air. True. Provides for uh, the article writers, though. If, if I was a conspiracy theorist, I would make up that this was a C++ um, whatever. Yes. Um, publishing these things to improve their TOB ratings. Uh, the, the C++ lobby. Yeah, you know, I was thinking of something more like the Templars, and we have to have <laughs> proper conspiracy theories here. The Illuminati. Ah, that was it. <laughs> the ending of this article is somewhat encouraging. Quote, the reality is that there are plenty of C++ jobs available in finance, and that compared to other languages, there are comparatively few people to fill them. The language may be hard, but it's also worth it. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why they are all searching for C++ programmers. The use of C++ is growing. So there might be slightly more to this um, article about this particular author, because there is a very, very long comment on Reddit about interviewing practices at the company the article author works for. And oh boy, you can read it for yourself, but I think the problem might be just there. Another article from the same website is titled C++ is the new Python. I don't know what that means. I, I hope I hope not. C++ is not aimed at everybody the way Python is. I, I would like lots and lots of good developers, good engineers using C++. What I really would fear if just about everybody tried to write everything in C++. That's not what it's for. The title is weird, but the article says that C++ is making a comeback. I didn't know it was gone. <laughs> I mean, it's declared dead every year, has been for the last yeah. 40. <laughs> and the other article is about Ubiana, actually. It's a oh, bit yeah. outdated. The title goes, The World's Top C++ Programmer and What He Does at Morgan Stanley. So, it's outdated. Yeah. And I'm sorry, but uh, calling Bjarne Stolstrup the top C++ programmer is like calling Tim Berners-Lee the top web designer. Right, so let's come back a little to the mailing. And I wanted to look at some more papers. This paper, Better Stadotupal Indexing, 
it proposes an interesting thing basically it's a sort of a, a literal with the ic suffix which would enable you to index tuple members instead of using std get with the template parameter uh, for the index of the tuple you would use uh, the subscript operator and the index would be uh, a number and then immediately after that uh, lowercase ic i think we've seen this trick in one of the tweets and i think i sort of explained um tried to follow the idea line by line in one of the earlier meetings but it i mean so this is just detected sugar yeah but does it really look like look better than std get no i think it looks uh, like you have to explain ic uh, yeah yeah exactly I mean, and, so uh, I'm not there's also the issue of uh, do you really want to encourage a serious increased use of tools? Do they belong in the guts of uh, libraries? Yeah, that's a good point, actually. They say that this is the way Boost HANA to HANA's tuples work. I haven't used HANA, but um, yeah, so there is apparently a precedent for this. The next paper is something that uh, Corentin mentioned in his corner article. The title is Zero Initialize Objects of Automatic Storage Duration. It proposes to, exactly that, it proposes to initialize all the stack variables, local stack variables to zeros. And if you don't want that, you could use a special attribute uninitialized. It's uh, by J.F. Bastian. And he claims that uh, this would solve lots of security related problems uh, because accessing uninitialized memory is UB. And currently, you can't detect it unless you use tools like Memory Sanitizer. And Memory Sanitizer is notoriously difficult to get working because you have to recompile everything with it. This is being discussed. Um, there are two things it removes UB. Um, if you use the core guidelines and the static analysis that I'm recommending, of course, it'll get caught before you start executing without any cost. Uh, there's a significant cost if you have a large uh, vector, like a buffer, and that's why you need the uninitialized. Um, there is one problem I discovered the hard way many years ago. If you default initialize something to zero, Zero is the worst default value you can have because it tends to delay uh, the catching of bugs from where zero isn't a good initializer uh, so that it's hard to find where the root cause is. And uh, if you had to have a default value, zero is, is lousy. Um, I tended to use a, a bit pattern that was zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, et cetera. And that caught my bugs very much faster. But of course, that has even higher cost for initialization. So it's not a, a uncontroversial issue, but it's being discussed. I think he does mention some other possibilities for the initialization value. Uh, it's like ff or some other aa like hex aa and stuff like that i think aa or some other uh, value is an equivalent of a cpu instruction that traps at runtime or something like that core, core guidelines uh, simply make sure you initialize all yeah actually microsoft visual c uses the cd hexadecimal to fill uh arrays or variables in debug builds and this happens to be the breakpoint instruction as well so if you happen to jump into that you'll break but uh, it's very easy to see that uh, in memory dumps or in any variables in the watch debug view so it's quite helpful yes. to see that okay this garbage is precisely this uninitialized garbage yes yes exactly. that's exactly what i did when i had to do it many years ago uh, curiously, I seem to remember that a Visual C++ compiler initializes uninitialized pointers to something like dead beef or bad food or something yeah, like that. Something, something, something like that. Yeah. And uh, the, 
I remember the first time I saw it, like in many, many years ago, I couldn't believe my eyes. <laughs> what is this? I'm like debugging a program and then seeing this in debugger. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you just have to have an unlikely value. Yeah. Then an evil developer is going to memory map something to the dead beef memory range. Just <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Jeff Bastian provides some benchmarks, performance impact, he says, is now negligible, less than half a percent regression if you, if you automatically initialize all the locals to zeros. And the code the, size the impact The problem is, also. is that it's hard to get a good set of grams to measure. But I, I'm not surprised. If you can eliminate buffers, that's the only uh, thing that I have ever found significant. That's why you need the uh, uninitialized attribute or value. Next, there were some contracts related papers that we haven't yet discussed today. This one got updated a proposal to publish a technical specification for contracts. It gained an introduction and an overview, which is useful. And the overview contains a bit of history. Uh, quote, our overarching goal is to enable the committee to ship a useful runtime contract checking, aka contracts feature in C++26. There was a bit of a background about the attempts. We all remember that uh, the paper was killed at the last minute. That was the original. The, the, I don't recall that it was discussed in... So another one was a proposed plan for contracts in C++ by Timo Dumler and John Spicer, uh, which outlines the steps. And I think it might have been sort of accepted. Uh, there is a table yes, with... Yes, uh, this is basically what a majority of SG21 think is the right way of doing things. Right. So... At least there's a plan. Some, some of us think that is not. Uh, they, they claim it's a minimally viable proposal. My particular claim that it is uh, too minimal to be viable. And that's what my paper says. Right. The other one was, uh, this is the uh, Gabby's that, paper, Gabby. Contracts for C++ Prioritizing Safety. Wait for the next version. Yeah. And the next one is deadline the fifteenth. Questions. Ah, uh, oh yeah, this this is the one. Questions on contracts for C plus plus prioritizing safety. They've addressed the cases where there is a, there are unavoidable side effects um, in uh, contract expressions. As I said, I think the the real problem was not addressed. Was not realized. Uh, there are uh, actually there are there seem to be some mentions on on the UB. I, I think this paper should also be applied. Those questions should be asked also for the uh, other proposal. Yeah, some of the questions are good and necessary questions. Oh yeah, there's a whole section compile time detection of potential UB. So yeah, I I suppose. But yeah, let let's wait for this second version of Gabby's paper. See what they say. And the last paper on contracts was uh, this one, classification of contract checking predicates. And not knowing too much about contracts, I thought that uh, it provided useful definitions. I haven't seen that one. Who wrote it? Joshua Byrne. I see, yeah. Yeah, so it's useful to have all the definitions like what's a contract, what's a contract check, uh, precondition, postcondition, essential behavior, contract violation, and so on. Mm, looks useful to me. This is a link that was new, new to me. It's uh, by Sweden CPP um, user group, and it's a blog role of all the C++ and related articles, uh, which is constantly refreshed so that you don't need to jump 
through all the blogs to see the titles. And thanks to Zdenek Vilcek for the link. And the other useful article was by Polina Alexeyeva. It's top 10 C++ conference talks in 2019-2022. This is on the PVS Studio blog, which is a static analyzer. There are direct links to the videos. And yeah, beyond this video is number one. And lots of other useful, interesting presentations. Sea Lion 2022.3 released. And some big news in this release are initial support for C20 modules. Well, given that they use CMake for their build meta meta build system, they must have supported it somehow using CMake, I'm guessing. But it's a it's a good thing to see. And a revolutionary new feature in C Lion is now CMake debugger. I don't think it's ever been available anywhere. Basically, you can step through your build script, which looks like magic given how complex CMake scripts could be. And you can display lots of local, I guess, logic and uh, variables, which is really nice. Sounds pretty useful, to be honest. Yeah. Lots of people are very happy about it. I mean, CMake is the de facto build system for C++ that we all love to hate. <laughs> and any help with that is very welcome. Right, I think that's it for today. And I will leave you with this tweet in response to a question on Twitter. What is a pointer? Tony Van Aert replies, anything is a pointer if you're brave enough. <laughs> <laughs> and on that happy and brave note, thank you very much for coming and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Cheers.